to John chapter 4 tonight. John chapter 4. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. So this, this is a pretty long chapter here. I want to try to see if we can't get through the whole thing. And then I want to tie in some stuff that we see here in John to the book of Revelation. Okay, there, there's a lot of questions out there about some things in uh, Revelation that people are making very complicated, but are actually the answers to it are very, very simple. And there are things that we learn here in John 4 that will help us with that. So hopefully we can have time to get through this whole thing. But verse 1 says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So right here, this, is, this passage is another example of what Jesus' true mission was while on earth. Okay? Here we have a lady, she's going to get water. If she's there to go to get water, she's obviously thirsty. She needs a drink of water, and Jesus, he needs a drink of water. Jesus is thirsty. Okay? And he's asking this woman for a drink. And you all know the story. You all know how it was with the Jews and the Samaritans. Okay, uh, The Jews, they were from the southern kingdom. Okay, People many times, they mistakenly refer to all 12 tribes as Jews. But you know the 12 tribes are Israelites. And Jews was something that was a title that was given later to the southern kingdom. Okay, Because that was where they were from Judah. And the term Jew, it was something that came along later after the kingdoms were split. And then that northern kingdom that we read about in the Old Testament, they got so intermingled with the Gentiles that they were known as Samaritans. And the Jews, who were more pure-blooded, I guess you could say, they hated the Samaritans. They hated them half-breeds. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. And so here we have Jesus asking something from a Samaritan. And that was strange to this woman. She'd never seen anything like this. But once again... In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Okay? That was something that wasn't revealed yet, but it was, it was about to, and Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He didn't care. Sometimes he would mention those things. You know, He would bring up the fact that they were uh, Gentiles and things like that, but he was trying to teach lessons in those things. It's very clear that Jesus loved everyone. But notice his purpose was not to take care of physical needs. Okay, he's talking to this lady about living water where she, if she drinks it, she'll never thirst. And she wants that water. She wants that water where she'll never have to draw water again. Okay? You and I don't understand the task, you know, how the task used to be difficult of just getting a drink of water. Imagine if we still had to go walk out to a well somewhere, drop a bucket, pull a bucket up, carry it back to the house. You know, we don't have to do that today. We just turn the faucet. You know, and thank God for that. But it used to be a big problem. And to think, man, I don't have to draw water anymore. That would be exciting. That would be a blessing. But you know, Jesus, while he did many miracles that helped with physical needs, those things were only done to prove he had the power to do the spiritual. Okay? We have many churches today, the modern church today, it's all about what can we do for people physically? What can we do for the community? Let's make, you know, let's do the meals for people. Let's feed the hungry, you know, let's clothe these people. And there's nothing wrong with doing some of those things, but the problem with many of these churches is that's all they do. And they're not preaching the gospel. They're not preaching the truth. And they're they're substituting 
the physical, the spiritual things for physical things. And yes, Jesus did things like that. He fed people. But every time Jesus would do those things, oh, what was that phone ringing for? It was probably just a salesperson. Every time he would do those physical things, it was to prove that he could do something spiritual. When he fed the 5,000, they were back again the next day, weren't they? Wanting food again. And that, when that, if he would have given that lady a drink of water, he could have done that. He could have just made a cup of water up here and give that to her. But do you understand? If he'd have done that, she'd have been thirsty again later that day. And we can do that for people. We can go and we could, you know, feed people and do all that stuff, but they're going to be hungry again the next day. And listen, what we need to be all about as a church and as believers is given the things that are of eternal value. Whenever Jesus would heal people of a sickness, they'd get sick with something else later. Every time he raised somebody from the dead, they would die again later. Okay? He did those things to prove he could do the spiritual. And listen, folks, we are not about doing those things today. Don't feel bad if you can't heal somebody in the hospital. If you can't raise somebody from the dead, Listen, we know how to tell people about Jesus. We know how to tell people how to get saved. And that's what it's really all about. And all of Jesus' miracles he did were temporary, but the spiritual ones that he did were permanent. And that's why he came. And so this is why we're not going to go around giving everybody money who asked for it. If we do, if we, you know, and we can, the Bible says we can give to whoever we want. But we don't have to. We're always going to have the poor with us. But here's the thing. If we go giving money to people... If we give money to somebody who calls, they're going to be calling again a month later. And then they're going to tell their friends, and then their friends are going to be calling us. And you know what? You know, we haven't got the money to take care of everybody's financial problems. But we do have the message that will solve everybody's spiritual problems, don't we? And that's why we are here. That's what it's all about. And that's why Jesus came. And yes, Jesus did the physical miracles, but they were all temporary. And not all miracles that Jesus did were the same. You know, some just like... Some of Jesus' teachings were more clear than others, weren't they? And listen, I don't think there's any way any of us could go through and accurately judge you know, the level of faith people had in these things. But really, you know, some of the miracles that Jesus did were huge, okay? Raising somebody from the dead. Okay? And then you had things that were maybe lesser, you know, cleansing a leper, which is still pretty good. Uh, you know. Some even less, maybe rebuking a dumb spirit. You could just say that person was faking. I mean, there were things that he did that were less than other miracles. But then there was also stories that he told that were more clear than others. Some of them were really hard. Some of them were really hard to get. And you know, I believe the reason we see a variation is because everyone in order to be saved, has to have faith, don't they? And so with some people, Jesus didn't have to do much at all. With this woman at the well, we're going to see what he did here in just a minute. Uh, we'll go ahead and read in verse, uh, let's keep, pick up in verse 15. It says, The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that thou saidst, that saidst thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Jesus, when he went and just showed that he knew everything about her, that was all it took for this woman. And think about how with other people, Jesus would do all these amazing miracles and they would still struggle to believe. But with, when it came to a Samaritan, he just basically had to tell her something about herself that he had no way of knowing. And then with the Gentiles, many times, he would do even less and they would believe him. And he was always commenting on the faith of the Gentiles versus that of the Jews. Because remember, the Jews require a sign. Yeah, which, yeah, don't get me going on that again. But listen, you know, it didn't, think about this for a second. It didn't take faith to believe in a physical miracle because there was definite proof, wasn't there? Okay, if you see somebody raised from the dead, okay, you're going to know this person is special, aren't you? Because he raised somebody from the dead. There's physical proof right there. A man who has a withered hand, who now has a hand that's normal. Where's the faith required in believing after you see that? There, there really, there is no faith and you have to have faith 
in order, in order to believe and meant the spiritual miracles. Because this is what Jesus really came for. This is what it's all about. The spiritual miracles that Jesus did, they all come with no physical proof, don't they? We have no physical proof that we are saved, do we? Now, you can talk about how you changed. You can talk about how you cleaned up your act. You can talk about how you used to be a drunk and a drug addict and all these things. And you changed it so you know you're saved. But you know what? Lots of people get over those things. Lots of people quit being drunks and drug addicts without getting saved. There is no physical proof that we can show to prove that anyone's saved. So how do we get saved? Well, we get saved by believing on Christ. So how do we know we're saved? We, we just believe God. We trust his word. He said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's all we need. I worry about people when you ask them, how do you know you're going to heaven? And they talk about themselves. Whenever I go soul winning, I like when people tell me what the Bible says. I like when they say, when they start talking about Jesus Christ and they start quoting his word, that's a person who has faith. That person who is confident they're going to heaven because of what the Bible says, not their experience they had. Well, I was in the hospital one time and I flatlined and the, I came back to life. And after that, I knew that God was real and I believed him because he you know, brought me back. He raised me from the dead physically. Well, great. That was physical salvation. Now, what about your spiritual salvation? Because if that was true, if God brought you back to life, that takes no faith, does it? But believing that he saved your soul, believing that you are going to heaven instead of hell only because of what the Bible says, that takes faith, doesn't it? And these miracles that Jesus did, you know, with those people, they all saw him when he fed the 5,000. They all saw that. They saw that miracle. Yet the next day when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. They're like, we're out of here. They moved on. They weren't willing to have faith. But here with this woman, when Jesus says, I'm the water of life, she figured it out. She got it. She had faith and she got saved. And many people, and we'll see that here in a little bit, but originally she wanted her physical needs taken care of. You know, people are going to want that. That's normal. That's fine to want your physical needs taken care of. It's normal for people to want religion or want Christ because they want their life to be better. Okay, that's normal. And if you follow the word of God, your life will be better. Even if you don't get saved, if you follow the principles of God's word, your life will get better. Okay, but that's once again, that's not that's not salvation. But originally she wanted her physical needs taken care of. But Jesus, all he had to do was the miracle of telling her about things that he had no way of knowing. And this miracle was to get her to pay attention. So she could start thinking spiritual. And it, it happened with her. It was that simple. When you think about all the amazing miracles that were done to the Jews and they didn't accept, and Jesus does this little thing, she could have been like, you probably talked to one of my neighbors. She didn't do that. She believed. Remember what Jesus said? You know, if the miracles would have been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, they would have repented. But they didn't do it. And God says it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah, I believe it was uh, who he referred to, than you. And so Jesus showed her. So, oh, well, go ahead in verse 20. Let's read verse 20. So she says, you know, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Okay. But then she says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, woman, believe me. The hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and, tr and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him much must worship him in spirit and truth. Jesus showed her that the form of worship that they had in Samaria, it was wrong and it was perverted. And when he says salvation is of the Jews, he was showing that the true form of worship was in Jerusalem. Okay, I, I don't know what all they did in Samaria during that time. I know back when the kingdoms originally split, you might remember the story where Jeroboam made the two golden calves and they started worshiping there and they got involved in all kinds of wicked abominations. And we don't know, you know everything that went on. You'd probably have to go to history to find out more 
of what they were doing in Samaria during that time. But because they were these half-breeds, they weren't allowed to go to Jerusalem to worship. Okay? Because of... And, and that was according to the law. Okay? This wasn't just according to the Jews being racist. This was according to the law because they had intermingled with these Gentiles and with these heathens. They were not able to go to Jerusalem to worship like you were supposed to. And, and so they did. They just came up with their own thing. And you know what? God didn't recognize it. And that's just a good side note there too for all these people that act like God recognizes all the other religions that people have just made up. No, He doesn't. Okay, These other religions that are out there, they're false, they're wicked, these people are going to go to hell unless they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, But Jesus tells her though, He's telling this woman, hey, that the hour is coming and now is. Where people, they're not going to worship in a physical place anymore, but they're going to worship Him and spirit and truth. That is what God wants. The Father is seeking such to worship Him. And we know that that can be anyone. None of us need to do a background check, go get our DNA tested done to find out where we come from. That is completely irrelevant. Okay, That kind of stuff only matters amongst the Jews and Christian Zionists. All right, With Christ, He doesn't care about that. It doesn't matter. And people need to stop making a big deal, deal about it. It's, uh, it's false. It's where racism comes from. And true Christians, you know, true Bible believers, we understand these things don't matter. We've been made all of one blood. And you know, uh, if people try to say that we're like the racist ones, just because, because we don't think the Jews are this master race of chosen people, they act like we're racist. Yet, if you're teaching like a master race, you're the racist one, okay? We teach we're all the same. So, you know... Good luck making that hold up in a court of law. But it probably would hold up in a court of law. Because you know who all the judges are. But, but anyway, anyway, that sounded pretty racist right there. But anyway, I, I, I'm just having fun with you. But listen, this, this here is another example of what God is looking for. God is not looking for a physical race of people. God wants people of faith. Those are the children of Abraham. I, I've been talking myself blue in the face on that stuff with people. I'm, and I, I'm just kind of getting tired of talking about it, you know? I'm, I'm about ready to just stop talking to people and just say, go listen to this sermon. Just, you know, here, let me forward you the link to this sermon. It, it lays it all out real clear. And you know what? Forget my sermon. Just go read the New Testament. Uh, you know, go read the book of Romans and Galatians. You won't even need me. You shouldn't need me anyway, but people's minds have been so twisted and perverted on this stuff. But the Old Testament saints... Clearly, we're looking forward to a Messiah. Look what it says in verse 25 of chapter 4. Now, this is a Samaritan. Okay, She's you know, from a perverted religion. It, it wasn't the true uh, religion of that time of Judaism. And it says in verse 25, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Oh, uh, they weren't looking to forward to a coming Messiah. Yeah, they were. Even the Samaritans knew about a coming Messiah. Even, even this woman understood that. They were looking forward to a coming Messiah. They didn't know his name was Jesus. But yet they did. They looked forward to those things. And they believed. Listen, everybody who's ever been saved has been saved the same way. By grace, through faith. They believe God. And it was revealed in the New Testament that it was Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us. His name was Jesus, not Emmanuel, Jesus. And everyone who's ever going to heaven, it's through Him. There is not a bride for God and another bride for the Son. We are all one. All over the Bible. That's another lesson for another day. But no, this Samaritan woman, she was, she was looking for a Messiah. And Jesus, notice this too, for these quacks out there trying to say that Jesus was only the Messiah for the Jews. This is a Samaritan woman. And Jesus talking to her when she said, we know the Messiah is coming. He will tell us all things. Jesus said, I that speak unto thee am he. He didn't say, I'm not your Messiah. Are you a Jew? Are you from, Je are, are you from Jewish stock? The Samaritans are never promised a Messiah. Jesus didn't say that to her daddy. No, what did he say? He said that I that speak unto thee am he. I got to work on that impression. My impression has been stinking lately. But anyway, 
Uh, but uh, it doesn't get any clearer again, folks. All right, we got to we got to we got to throw these Bible deniers right out right out on their backsides. But anyway, so very clear. So the salvation of the pe- people in Samaria, it was the we're going to see here. It was the result of labor of many people before Christ. Okay, once again, you know the Bible doesn't tell us everything that happened throughout the past time. But let's look at verse 27 through 38. Look at some interesting things that said. So in verse 27, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought, meat, brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus is trying to get the disciples thinking spiritual again, but they're struggling. You know, you know he's talking about meat here, and they're like, you know, did somebody give him meat that we don't know about. You know, they, these people were so carnal in their minds. And then verse 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is this say, that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestow no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Uh, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. That's where we see that statement where Jesus said the fields are white already into harvest. You know what Jesus is telling his disciples? Hey, there, there's a harvest of people out there ready to be saved. And you know what? You all didn't even do any labor to get to that point. There, but it's ready to go. The harvest is ready. And who, who was it that had done the labor? You know, maybe it was some of the prophets in the past. Maybe there were people who went through there and preached some things. We don't know. But notice how these people, they were like ready to go. They were ready to get saved. Sometimes that happens when we're out soul winning. You'll go and you'll run into somebody. Then I mean, there's been already some labor in that person. There's already been, somebody's already witnessed that person. And we are fortunate enough to be there to do the reaping. Somebody else did the labor. I told you about the guy a while back, uh, a couple months ago that I led to the Lord. I asked him if anybody ever told him how he could know for sure he's going to heaven. He's like, my dad's been talking to me about that. My dad's in prison. He got religion or something in prison and has been telling me about it and want me to get saved. And man, that guy was ready to go. I mean, it was so easy leading that guy, Lord. Somebody had already done a bunch of work in him. And I got to be there for the harvest. And it was exciting. Just Saturday, the same thing. I'm talking to that guy outside the place. This man, he'd been in church a lot. It's not a very good church. But yet, he had learned enough. He understood some key things. And, you know, there had a work had been done. It wasn't very good work. But it had done enough that it wasn't hard for me to take the Scriptures and to just do the reaping right there. And I, I got, got to see him get saved. But you know what? Even though that other church didn't do a very good job teaching him, they had taught him a little bit. And you know, that's why we shouldn't get discouraged too when we're out there soul winning. You have no idea what kind of an impact you're having on that person. You have no idea. They might just argue with you and maybe even be nasty. But you know what? Maybe your visit will get them thinking. Maybe your visit will get them reading their Bible. Maybe they'll actually read that gospel track that we leave. And then maybe the next person... We'll get them. We don't know. We don't know who's been being witnessed to. Maybe they've got a family member in another state somewhere that's a fundamental Baptist that's been trying to witness to them. And they're, all, they're almost ready to go. And we just get to be there to do the reaping. It's exciting. And that's why we just need to tell, tell everybody we can. Just tell everybody we can because you might not be the one that gets them saved right then. But you know what? You might prepare the next person. You might prepare them so the next person will get them. We have no idea. And, and we've, just, we've got to be faithful on that soul winning. And I think, believe that's what Jesus is talking about here. You know, y'all are doing the reaping. You didn't do a lot of the labor that was before. 
Who, who all did it? I don't know. I believe one of the reasons Jesus had a lot of the success that he had in his ministry was because of John the Baptist, who had prepared the hearts of the people. He had prepared the way of the Lord. That was why these, you know, Jesus was so quick at getting these multitudes. You can say it was all about Jesus, but the Bible says that John was going to be sent to prepare the way of the Lord, to make his path straight. Let's get, he was going to get things ready for Jesus. So during his short time, he could get as much as much done as possible. And John the Baptist helped with that. And we don't know who's been out there before us. And we don't know who's coming out after us. And so that's why we just need to be faithful. Just keep plugging away. We have no idea what kind of impact we're having when we're out there being a witness, knocking on doors. You have no idea. And so uh, in verse 39, go ahead and turn to verse 39. It says, uh, Many of the Samaritans in that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Where's the miracles there? He really, we don't see him doing much miracles. He told that lady what she had done. And then the, the rest of these people are believing because of his own word. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? That's all we did. Okay, we didn't, I never saw any miracles before I got saved. I just I believed his word. And they did. He spent those two days there. Many believed his word. And in um, verse 20, 42, and said unto the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this indeed is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. They heard, they heard those words and they knew. And after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. He's like, man, these people over here, they think I'm the greatest thing in the world. But when he'd go to his own country, when he'd go to Nazareth, Bible says he didn't he didn't do many mighty wonder uh, mighty works there because of their unbelief. They're like, is not this the carpenter's son? You know, we know his Mary and his brothers and his sisters are all here with us. There's nothing special about this guy, and he's doing all he's doing miracles. He didn't do a lot because of their unbelief, but he did some. He did more than he did in Samaria, but yet these people in Samaria are all accepting. And listen, it's the same thing in the world today. You know, in America, we're so stinking blessed. We've got churches on every corner. We've got Bibles all over the place. Yet, people, when you go to, you know, door knocking out here, you get very little reception. But then you have these people that do these mission trips in some of these poor countries, and these people get saved like crazy. I mean, they, they'll win the masses to Christ in these other countries. And we see how, you know, the religious many times struggle with faith, where the people in these heathen countries, just kind of like in the Bible. They get it quicker than we do. And one of the reasons people struggle out here too, the religious people struggle, is religious people, they think there is no way, I've been going to church all my life, I've been giving my money, I've done all the things I'm supposed to do, there is no way some savage over in Africa is going to get to heaven before me just because he called on the Lord. Well listen, he's going to because he had faith and you didn't. Because he trusted in his works and you don't. And the Bible makes it very clear. We're not saved by works. You don't believe God. That's all there is to it. And so, yeah, they're going to go to heaven before these religious people, before these sweet, wonderful, you know, big money giving religious people. They will go to heaven first. So Jesus did. He had to do far less to get the Samaritans saved than he did many of the Jews. And we see this is a common thing. It's still the same way today. And, you know, it's it, uh, Jesus got Samaritans saved easier than Jews and he got Gentiles saved easier than the Jews. And today it's easier to get unreligious people saved than the religious people. Saturday, you know, we talked to a lot of religious people. We talked, we had a bunch of mean old Lutherans on Saturday, just mean ones, nasty one of them was just like, no, this, this lady, we're walking along, try to say hi, we're being friendly, you know? And she's like, oh, no, I'm all covered. You know, I'm, I'm good. And she did the sign of the cross. And then Brother Thomas, he's like, he's like are you Catholic? And I'm like, no, Lutheran. I'd never seen a Lutheran do that. I didn't know Lutherans did that. And then, man, we had like two old, grumpy, mean Lutherans in a row. That, I mean, just, I mean, growling at us practically. And then uh, talked to a, a hardcore, like a hardcore 
Pentecostal guy. I mean, hardcore. I, I know the church that he's from, and I've known people from this church. These people literally are the best people you will ever meet in your life in this church that he's from. They are, these people blow, they blow us away. All right. They, I mean, they, they are the most decent, the most strict. I mean, they, they don't do anything wrong. You know, I mean, I'm, I know, I know we're all sinners, but I'm telling you, I've worked with some of these guys. These people will blow your mind, but I I've talked to them too. And they had works to salvation. And even though they're better than me, if they don't put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his work, alone they're not going to go to heaven even though they're better than me i'll admit it i I'm, i will i will not deny it with these people i don't even want to tell you the church i don't want you know just because um i i used to tell people all the time you know if i ever quit being baptist i'm going to that church because those people they were they were they were impressive and if i if i did if i went over to that church and i acted like those people i could walk around saying i'm better than everybody else and i'd be telling the truth i mean they are but if they're not putting their faith and trust in Christ, they're not going to heaven. Okay, you don't get to heaven by being better than me. Right? And so don't you know? Don't think I'm lifting them up too much. I think they're going to hell. But they're good people compared to me. I I, I will admit it. And so it, we see. You know, it, it is. It's easier to go soul winning in a heathen country than in religious America. And so now I'll go to verse 45. It kind of changes directions a little bit here. But it says, Then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came into Canaan of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When Jesus heard, or when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The noble said unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed and his whole house. This again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. I don't know if you realize what was happening here. But, you know, Jesus, he's just been over in Samaria and he's seen some real faith. And so he's talking to this nobleman and, you know, and he says, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Once again, if Jesus has to do signs and wonders, there's no faith, is there? And so what did Jesus tell him? He just said, your son liveth. And when the man believed and he went, his son was healed. He didn't see this and, and the man did. The man truly believed. Otherwise, the son wouldn't have been healed. But this man, he wanted Jesus to come. No, you know, I, I, I need to see you heal my son. But, you know, Jesus wants the man to have faith. Okay, that guy's son ended up dying of something later on. I don't know what it was, but he, he, died. he wanted that man to believe. He wanted him to get saved. That's what he is here for. And so he tells him, you better believe. You need to believe me. And the man did. And because of that, his son was healed. But notice that the man believed before the miracle happened. And once again, that is what Jesus came for, is for the spiritual things, the permanent fixes, not the temporary fixes, the permanent fixes. And we see here in John chapter 4, the story of the woman at the well, and Jesus talks about living, living water and the title of this week's is Jesus Christ, the water of life. Now, turn over to uh, Revelation chapter 22. I want to show you something here in Revelation chapter 22. The dispensationalists, I've listened to some of them preach here recently, and they are scratching their heads about this passage. Okay, Listen, when your doctrine's messed up, there's lots of things in the Scripture that are going to get really complicated. Okay, But when you get things lined up and your head screwed on straight, things actually become very, very clear. And I'm going to show you something here 
in Revelation 22 that I've already proven to be true based on what we have seen in John chapter 4. But look what it says in Revelation 22. Remember, John, who wrote Revelation, is the same one who wrote the Gospel of John that we just read. So it says in verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Okay? A pure river of water of life. That's It's coming from out of the throne. Okay? Verse 2, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now, all these verses that we read are these future events. Not a trick question. Right. They're obviously future events. Okay, All of that is future. All of that is after the tribulation, after the wrath of God, after the millennial reign. Okay, All of those verses, they are future. Okay, Where we see a water of life, or a river of water of life, coming out of the throne. Okay, And... W- Here's what happens. We're gonna the dispensationalists. They take this passage, and I was listening to one preach about it the other day. And you know, it's like you know, tell me what that means. You know, the way you get saved, you know, in the millennium or after the millennium, you know, you have to take of the water of life. You have to drink from the water of life in order to get saved. And I heard that I'm like, are you serious? You think that the one of the ways people are going to get saved in the future is to Drink actual water of life. Have we not read the Gospels? How do we drink of the water of life? It's like Baptist preachers today, they can't get the simple things that that woman at the well got, that Samaritan woman got. Okay, because here's, because watch, what we just read there was all future, but now what we're going to be reading was present tense when he wrote it, okay? Verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Okay? Remember, this message is John, he's writing this to the seven churches. Okay? And these angels are coming. They're showing him visions. They're showing him things that must come to pass. And what we are reading right now, it is not a future thing. Okay? For us right now, it's a present thing. Okay, it's been it was you know it was for that time when John wrote it. Verse seven: Behold, I come quickly. Okay, right here, Jesus hasn't come yet, has he? Okay, we're still in that time now. This is not future. Behold, I come quickly. He that uh, he that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy of this book, um, or blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. For the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murders and idolaters and whosoever loveth that maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. He told his angel to tell these things to the churches. What churches? The seven churches of Asia Minor that John was writing to. Okay, this we are we are back in first century right here. Okay, this applies to us today. This is not future. Verse seventeen. And the Spirit and the Bride say, "Come." This is now, folks. This is a message to us now. This is not a future thing. And let him that heareth say, "Come." And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Now, why would some dispensationalist goofball say, you know, the way you're going to get saved in the millennium, you, know, you got to drink from the water of life? 
And the, yes, if it's talking about faith in Jesus Christ, but did that woman at the well drink a cup of water to get saved? No, what did she do? She, by faith, took the water of life. By faith, she believed on Christ. And in doing that, she got saved and she'll never need to get saved again. And that message of whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely, that is not a future thing. That's present. That is for, that is for right now. Those first five verses, we're talking about something in the future, but it's, ba it's back now to John's present time where he's writing. It was a message that he was supposed to give to those churches in the first century. And whosoever will let him take of the water of life freely, that is for us right now. And the way we take of the water of life is we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is not another way of salvation in the future. It's the, this is our way of salvation right now. By faith, accepting Christ. Well, what about that water of life coming from the throne? Well, listen, every river has a source that the water comes from. And if it's coming from the throne, where do you think the source of that water is? Jesus Christ. All right? There's no mistake that it says like that. And I believe there will be a literal river of water after the millennium there in heaven coming from the throne. But the source of that is Jesus Christ. And we don't have to wait until the end of the millennium to take of the water of life. We can take it right now when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like that water of life is just it's coming from the throne. Water doesn't come from a throne. Okay, that, that's a, that, that, this is a miracle. Okay, this is something of God. But what did Jesus say to that woman? He said that wa that water that I give, it will be you know a well of springing up. I'm not quoting that right. What's that? Yeah, the water comes from the rock. Just like we see that water that came from the rock in the Old Testament, a picture of Jesus. Water doesn't come from a rock, but it did when God wanted it to. Water doesn't come from a throne. Well, it does if it's a throne where God Himself sits, where Jesus Christ sits. And the taking of the water of life, it is a, not a physical thing we do. It is something that we do by faith. The woman at the well could figure it out, but the dispensationalist Baptist can't figure that out. They're scratching their head. You know, another way of salvation in the future. One way of salvation from the beginning of time till the end of time. The water of life, Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith, not of works, 100% of the time, for everybody, for one body, Jesus Christ is that water of life. And if you've never taken a drink of that, don't go looking for physical water somewhere. You need to believe on Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you will take that drink of water spiritually and you'll never thirst again. It's a one-time thing. You'll never have to get saved again. You'll never thirst again. Once again, he spoke of these physical things, trying to teach them spiritual truths that were permanent. And thank God our salvation is permanent. permanent. So with that, let's all stand together.